So thank, uh, I thank Nir for giving me this opportunity to talk here. And it's about something that is, uh, at the moment, very far from uh, principal electronics. But if you look in the future, it might very well be possible that we can use biomolecules as, print, as the material that will be printed. And so I will talk about proteins as dopable solid state electronic materials. And I should tell you that it's rare that one gets the chance to follow up on something that was a dream when you are a graduate student. I actually wrote a proposal in the last year of my graduate studies on something like this. If I look at it now, I don't have it anymore, but I can remember it was quite rubbish. And so it was indeed not approved. But the main problem then was that we really did not have the tools to start looking at this. And nowadays we do, both in electronics in, uh, and in uh, biology. So the idea is to look at them as electronic materials. Now you should be aware of the fact that nature does not use electronic transport the way we use it in as far as we know. <coughs> it has electron transfer, and electron transfer is a critical process in life, but it is always accompanied by ionic transport, and as we shall see, there is a very critical difference between electronic transport, as I measure, and some others, and what happens in nature. And this has not been appreciated. So there is this process of electron transfer. And it should be, as I'll try to show to you in the next 20 minutes or so, distinguished from electron transport. The first observation is that proteins can survive partial dehydration. They can work very well outside water, as long as you do not take away the structural water that allows them to keep their natural conformation. Naturally, if you take them out of water, they cannot do those processes where water provides some of the other components. But other things like photoactivity or redox activity, they will do. So I'll show that proteins are quite efficient solid state transport me uh, media. And on this plot, a log, log, uh, a log um, semi-log plot, this is the current density normalized to an area of square nanometer. A molecular length in angstrom, macroscopic measurements of saturated molecules. And they're all done in a very similar way, the measurements. I won't go into that at the moment. Then these are measurements on conjugated molecules. They're here. And here are proteins. I will talk about these proteins. And you see the, the data are pretty close to those of conjugated molecules, which is not the way I would have thought when I started molecules, uh, proteins would behave. And then there are these outlayers, and we are at the moment investigating if that is really true or not, because they seem to be too good to be true. By the way, those outlayers are membrane proteins, and these are not membrane proteins. So yes, they can be good transport uh, uh, media. The cofactor in the protein is central. Proteins are made up of lots of amino acids which are connected by peptide bonds. But there's generally something else that gives them function, and that the biologists call cofactor or prosthetic group. And yes, it's important, we'll see. Because of that, we have shown that proteins can be doped. They can be doped like organics at about the same density. The amide backbone may very well be involved in elastic transport. I will not talk about our inelastic electron tunneling spectroscopy. The most important thing is, yes, they are functional and dopable in the uh, partial dehydra dehydrated state. So the ultimate goal here is given, and I will not talk today about the peptides. I will, for the moment, focus on the proteins. I want to control and be able, ultimately, to predict. I'm not there yet, but some control we have. So on today's menu, because proteins you know better as something that you eat, are these proteins which have in nature the function of transferring electrons. That's what they should do. Azerine and bacteria, and we are full of cytochrome C. 
And then there is this protein which was described to me by a biologist as the garbage collector of the cell. It collects all kinds of stuff, but it has no electronic or electrical function. No. Our main experimental approach is given in this schematic. I put proteins as a monolayer on a conductive substrate, and then I have to put an electrical top contact on there and measure. There are some conditions that have to be met. The substrate has to be smooth. This will explain uh, the fact that most of my results that I show you are on silicon. So we use silicon for a reason that's a bit different than many of you use it. It's the one substrate we can get reproducibly very flat. The protein layer should be dense, and usually it's linked by a short linker. So this is what we hope we have. Unfortunately, this is an optimistic picture of what we probably have. And that holds naturally also for molecules. Yes? And then we have to put the top electrode on there, which has to be suitable, suitable for, to contact soft matter. You should not kill the patient. And that's very easy. And you shouldn't get anything that goes through here as a short. So these are the substrate that we use, and uh, which we have successfully used. For silicon, if you use it, you grow a very thin oxide on there, and then you put a glue on it, one of these types of molecules. The top electrode it is one of the biggest problems. And my group has done a lot of work on it. And actually, the previous speaker, when he was a postdoc with me, contributed significantly to that. So one way is the easy way out. It's the mercury electrode. And it's, uh, it works nearly always, even though mercury has a very high surface tension. You can get very highly reproducible results. Another one that was developed by Alan Mons in my group is lift of floton. Um, where we take a pre-prepared pad of a metal, generally gold, it can be aluminum. Nowadays, we also use PSS. This gives you a 0.2 millimeter square in most cases. That's the area we use, area of a contact. We call that macroscopic. That means that we have 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 9 proteins per contact. Why am I so uncertain? I am so uncertain because I'm talking in front of electrical engineers. You know much better than I do, the problems of making an electrical contact and knowing the real surface area of your contact. Actually, all of my knowledge I got from some very old books on electrical contacts. And it turns out that this topic has been discussed, and it's well known that you can go from a factor of 10 to 10 to the fourth in, as the ratio between the real contact area and the geometric contact area. So for, for, from various studies, we conclude that we may be between 10 to the 7, and 10 to the 9 is the geometric area that many people use. It's probably closer to 10 to the 7. Now, there's a new method that we use, which is evaporation of lead, because ev lead can be evaporated under very mild conditions. And this picture I love, because the layer that you don't see here are the molecules. These are organic molecules that we used. And silicon, lead, and this is another lecture, but Lead is now being used by us also. And if we had money for a separate evaporator, we would be using bismuth, which is even better. But anyone who has used bismuth knows that you can use it only on, in one evaporator, because that evaporator you cannot use for anything else. Another way is by for making top electrode through the soft matter is a conductive probe AFI. And quite a few groups have used that, and we also. And the advantage there is that you know the force. It also turns out to be something that is somewhat neglected. So these are the cartoons. You put your uh, proteins here, and you come with a tip. It can be platinum, gold. And you have about 100 proteins per contact, even though some groups will claim they have single molecule contact. And I'll show in a minute while that is maybe somewhat overdoing it. So these are the cartoons that we use to say that we have single molecule contact. Now, in this is a SEM picture of a real uh, AFM tip, conducting AFM tip. Now, we have blown this up to the size so that we can actually put a protein here. And that shows you that it is not so likely that in these measurements, with this kind of tip, not STM, STM is very different, yes? 
you will get a single molecule. You get many more. But STM you can get to one molecule. So here are current voltage characteristics, current density voltage for various proteins. Serum albumin, azurin, and cytochrome C, the proteins that were on the menu, if you remember. So these are the two that have in nature the function of transferring electrons. And this one does not. And lo and behold, on the linear scale, you see that they are separated. And indeed, there's about an order of magnitude, two orders of magnitude difference between the two in terms of efficiency by which they transport current. Now, they transport current a lot better than what you would expect that you would get probably something like nano or picoamps. This is at room temperature. And they all are in exactly the same configuration. The big question that many people in who work with this ask is what's the mechanism? And this here we can naturally profit from what people have done in molecular electronics and look at the log conductance versus length. And the schematic is that as long as you're to somewhere around here, you have tunneling, and then beyond that you get hopping. So, and the tunneling then supposedly coherent, although we come back to that in a minute. Here, this would be the rate of electron transfer. And it would be dependent on the length that you have to go through, L. And here, hoping I would have a thermally activated process. So I should be able to distinguish by doing temperature dependence. Now, first, the ex experimental data from the world of electron transfer, where people take proteins, put them in water, do fancy experiments, generally photo-induced electron transfer. And lo and behold, they get this very nice plot, which then fits with this schematic plot. And there are several plots like that that people have done. So yes, that seems to work. Remember, two nanometers, a little bit more than two nanometers, and that's where the shift should be from tunneling to um, uh, hopping. So hopping, thermally activated, tunneling, generally considered super exchange, which means that there is the participation of uh, energy levels below the vacuum level, yes, temperature independent. And then comes in a new thing, two-step tunneling, which for me is somewhat of a misnomer. But the community of electron transfer loves it. They said, yes, we have two steps. And there is such a small electro act activation energy that you cannot measure. It seems to be very important for the people who work on biological electron transfer. I have a running argument with the gurus that, for me, it seems to me that it's just a matter that we can't go to low enough temperature to see the, the activation energy. However, the beta values, these decay, uh, length decay uh, parameters that we find are much lower than the ones that are found for natural electron transfer in solution. The decay parameter in molecular electronics tells you something about um, how good the molecule can actually, how efficient the molecule is in electron transfer. And the lower the value, yes, the more conjugated generally the molecule or the other way around. So there is already a difference here, and we have to see why. So to study it, I said we'll vary the temperature, and we modify the protein. This is what I meant by doping. We're going to remove the cofactor, which often is a redox uh, factor, at least in the proteins that I'll deal, by, uh, I'll deal with in this lecture. We can replace that. We can add the cofactor. We can change the binding to the electrode. We can change the orientation of the protein. These are all experimental tools that we have, that we have available nowadays because of the development of science and technology. So if we look at the temperature dependence of a protein, azurin, and this has been taken down, by the way, to about 10, 15 K, but it's uh, very boring. Straight line. Here I'm looking at the linker, the six angstrom linker molecule without the protein. And as expected, tunneling, because I have temperature independence. Then comes the surprise. Azurin, which is a three and a half angstrom long, three and a half nanometer, 35 angstrom long protein, is completely temperature independent. That does not fit with what we teach in molecular electronics. And it doesn't fit sufficiently so that one of the great theoreticians of molecular electronics has become interested in it and is trying to find a way to explain it, Juan Carlos Cuevas. But there's no answer yet. Then there is this point. This point is very interesting. 
This is at a high temperature. At this point, I cannot go back here. It is an irreversible drop in the efficiency to transfer current. And why is that? Because the protein has denatured. And this is exactly the temperature at which it should denature. Therefore, this experiment, which was not designed to do it, tells me that I had the protein in the right conformation because it denatures at the temperature at which it should denature. It loses the water that if it has, in this case there's no water, but in most proteins there is, the water that keeps the structure together or some of the weak bonds actually break and the system becomes just a blob of amino acids bound by amide bonds. So the azurin, which has a copper ion here, and that is what gives its real attractivity from copper 2 to copper 1, that's how it works in nature, yes, it's called hollow azurin, it means it's intact. I can take the copper out, and then I see a completely different behavior. The system becomes strongly temperature dependent, and then it becomes temperature independent. And all the proteins that we have measured are temperature independent somewhere around this temperature, and down. Now, this has not been measured before for the simple reason that you need sensitivity. And if you use, use larger areas, you gain in sensitivity because you're measuring more proteins. And we know this from chemistry. You can get better sensitivity with a normal chemical experiment than with a single molecule chemical experiment. Single molecule experiments have their advantages, but sensitivity is not one of them. So all proteins become simple uh, media for tolerating transport at low enough temperatures. By the way, again, we have here the uh, denaturation. It's at a slightly different temperature as it should be. Now I can do the following. I can change the copper to nickel or cobalt or zinc. And as you see, when I put zinc in, which is not redox active, I go down more than in anything else. This is already what I'll start calling doping, but we'll go further. So I have some uh, way to start manipulating this integrate protein, because here, apparently, because the nickel can go nickel 2,3 and cobalt, cobalt 2,3, there is a possibility to have redox activity. And the big question is, is there any redox activity here? First, we want to make sure that we can indeed connect with what mostly has been done, which is conducting proper AFM studies on Azurin literature data and our data. And now there's something very important. You have to be able to know what is the um, force that you apply. By the way, this is one way of doing it. This is another way of doing it, and they give essentially the same result, which is good news. By the way, this is, this is a li an, uh, linear scale, so these differences are not so bad. I generally try with proteins not to go beyond 1 volt and below minus 1 volt because of stability issues. Although in the experiments that it was done, plus minus 2 volt might be right. However, the closer I can stay to 0 volt, the easier it will be for theory to uh, try to fit the data because generally the theoretical models are equilibrium models or close to equilibrium. Now we can do temperature dependence to see if what we got, this strange in the temperature independent behavior, was an artifact or not. Naturally, I cannot do now temperature dependence down to 10K. Actually, doing temperature dependence is not so easy at least in our system, we managed to do it over this temperature range, and this for us is temperature independence. If I do it with apoazurin, which has a strong temperature dependence, lo and behold, I see a temperature dependence, and furthermore, here we see the denaturation. So everything seems to be okay if I go from the macroscopic to the nanoscopic. The macroscopic data are valid. We have at least passed the test of that the, re the results, one type of results can be reproduced. Now we can also here do something that is force dependent. And we did that because we wanted to know if the force has an effect that might give the make the data somewhat artifactual. So for apoazurin, what you see is that the temperature dependence remains. Everything is normal because as I increase the force, 
the distance over which the electron has to, turn, has to uh, um, be transported becomes smaller and smaller, and therefore my currents will go up. And this is easily seen here. However, for the natural azurine, this is the these are the results we got with 6 nanonewton. As you go up in force, you change the mechanism. Now, this is a very important lesson because AFM is a very popular technique to do these experiments. However, some experiments are done at 40 nanonewton, 50 nanonewton. Why? Because you want to get current, you want to measure some things. At these high forces, you have no idea what you're measuring. However, at the lowest current, because the, why did he no, not go below 6 nanonewton? Because you needed certain signal to noise to make your results reliable. And that you get at 6 nanonewton. By the way, the real force is higher because there's an adhesion force of another 5 nanonewton. So the total force is about 10 to 11 nanonewtons. Now we go to our next player, cytochrome C. And cytochrome C, when we bind it electrostatically, gives a very different transport. It's much more like the protein we saw before without a copper. Cytochrome C has a heme group, a porphyrin with an iron. Now, now let's go back here for a minute, because I forgot to tell you something. This is azurine, and there's this little tail. The little tail of azurine is a cysteine. For those of you who don't know, cysteine has an SH group, sulfur H. SH can easily bind to gold or to another S group. So it's a way to covalently bind my protein to a substrate. And that's what's done with azurin. That's also why it's so popular. Cytochrome C, no such luck. So what we did, we electrostatically fizzy sorbed it on the surface, and that's what we got. This is the heme group, which has the iron, which can do the redox, iron 2, iron 3. If we now take out <clears throat> the iron, we don't see much difference. The system can't anymore do the redox. With the heme group out, we see a big change. And I should tell you that here, the structure, the conformation changes. But this is an intriguing result. So maybe for solid state electron transport, I don't need the redox process, the first indication. What is then the mediator? And so if you look at azurin, cytochrome C, apple azurin, the one without the copper, and this is the garbage collector, serum albumin. These are the temperature dependencies combined in one picture. We are going to use doping to find out what is the mediator. And so we go to this serum albumin, which did not have a special group like copper or heme, and we're going to put heme in or something like heme, called heme. So it's a ring with an iron. And we can put it in, and we're even lucky because people have worked on this for other reasons, and they have a crystal structure. So we know exactly where it sits. For most of these proteins, actually for all of them until now, the crystal structure is known. <coughs> and that's also something a little bit different from when I was uh, a graduate student. So we can look at the current voltage curves, again, of the HSA and the HSA with the hemine. And you see the hemine gives a big difference in current. We can compare this one with the cytochrome C, which has this heme group. And you see that the, at room temperature, there's not much difference. Maybe that's just chance by room temperature. Let's look and what happens at the temperature dependence. The temperature dependences are different. And by the way, here, I should tell you, this is strange behavior, you see. It goes down and up. And that fits with a known phase transition in the protein. And we see it whenever there is such a phase transition, conformational change. I shouldn't use phase transition, sorry. Conformational change. Anyone who teaches phase transition, strike it from the record. <coughs> If we compare HSA hemine and cytochrome C, both electrostatically bound, they're not too different except for this behavior. Now we go into electrochemistry. In electrochemistry, yes, you know, but I'll stress it, you go from electronic to ionic transport. 
and back to electronic transfer. That's what you do in an electrochemical experiment. And therefore, you have to pass, transfer a complete electron. You have to do a redox process. So that means that in this case, you have to do the iron 2, iron 3 plus reaction in electrochemistry. And that's why you see the cyclic photomograph. And you can get even the rate constants. And the rate constants, my students said, they are very different. For me, they are remarkably similar. I take a good for nothing, sorry, protein. I make it into a redox protein by adding an artificial molecule. And out comes a protein complex that behaves like a natural protein to within a factor of four and a half, five. To me, that's remarkable. So let's go a bit further. We can now compare the HSA hemine with the HSA with just the microcycle without the iron. And the results are very similar, as we saw before for cytochrome C, if I take the iron out. However, if I do the electrochemistry, I get a huge difference. I essentially use to within the, the cleanliness, the pur purity of my material, I lose the electrochemical reaction. Not surprising. Without the iron, the thing can't do what it's supposed to do. But what is the, mes the message from this? That in solid state electron transport, it's the porphyrin ring rather than the iron that's the main mediator. While the electron transfer is always redox control. And this leads immediately to the main difference between the solid state electron transport, which we would like to use in future battery electronics, and what we know from natural electro, uh, electron transfer. In one case, you need the redox process. In the other case, you don't. And by the way, this is very smart, although I do not want to put myself in the place of the creator. But if it weren't like that, we'd all be dead, because these proteins are two good conductors. They are two good electron conductors. Nature decided very smartly that it needs control. In this way, nature is a control freak. And the control it gets by insisting on a redox process because from the electronic, it goes to the ionic, and then back to the electronic, for example, in the electron transport chain in photosynthesis. So what is it good for? I don't know, but I'm very excited about this new insight, as you can maybe see. So you can dope serum album with other things, like retinoate. And we've done that. You can put one, two, three, four in. Especially at three and four, you get a huge jump in uh, uh, electron transport efficiency. And you also get a decrease, continuous decrease in the activation energy of the thermally activated part. So something's happening there. All that we know, because we don't have crystal structures here, is that this is one of the few proteins that conducts more efficiently than azurin, although it's much bigger. And for a molecular electron electronician, this would seem to be obvious, because you put many way stations in on the way, which are nice conjugated molecules that can help you to decrease the activation energy. Then there's also, at the end, the importance of the contact to the electrodes and the orientation. So I can compare electrostatic versus covalent binding. And you see a huge difference. So you can get control by covalently binding. And this we did with mutants, which we got from colleagues in Moscow. And we can put the covalent binder at different spots of this molecule. And we get different results depending, in this case, on the orientation of the heme ring with respect to the electrodes. So the conclusions are that proteins can, can definitely serve as solid state electron transport media. And that the mechanisms that we see can, for the moment, be explained by hopping and tunneling, although we have this big question, why are they so efficient? What is there that seems to give them this extra boost in efficiency that we wouldn't expect? Yes? then they can uh, also be doped. And this we get from comparing the conductions from modified proteins. This we got from temperature-dependent conduction. And both the type of the contact and the orientation are important. And furthermore, the electron transport studies that we do can teach us by na about natural electron transfer, and we can learn from that as long as we keep in mind that there are very significant differences. And only ETP naturally is relevant to the bioelectronics of solid state bioelectronics, if there ever will be one. And I'll leave you, I'll show you the, the differences. These are numbers that show you 
that proteins can actually cover a nice range of uh, transport efficiency. These are the people that uh, I did to work with in my group. I work with Muri Sheves and Yisrael Pecht. One of the nice things that the vice minister, the vice president has enough time to do a lot of research, that's Moody. And Israel is a card-carrying electron transfer protein specialist, Nadav Mdowski now at Imperial College. Deborah decided to become a teacher. Wendy is in Shenzhen and Hong Kong. And Leo is trying to finish his PhD. And the acknowledgments to who gave money. And thank you for listening.